Okay. Great. Thanks very much, Scott. And uh, thank you uh, to Larry for the invitation to participate in this uh, symposium. It's the first time I'm participating on the symposium. I looked at some of the previous editions, and that really made me very enthusiastic to come and be here with you. And I want to thank Mike for uh, his presentation because I'm going to use some of the concepts that he tried to convey to us uh, in, the, in the way in which we're actually trying to think about the problem of regeneration. By regeneration, I'm going to explain what that means in just a second. What you're looking at behind you, it's, uh, or behind me actually, it's a number of uh, really small um, organisms known as planarians. They're about the size of a toenail clipping. And uh, they look fairly insignificant. They actually were obtained from an abandoned fountain in Barcelona, Spain. Essentially, puns come. And uh, these animals uh, actually harbor remarkable secrets about our own biological functions that still remain to be revealed, right? And so I'm just feeding them liver, which has been stained with two different uh, food dyes. And that's uh, just to keep you entertained while I'm talking, right? So what I want to start with is the problem of regeneration. So this problem fascinates me, and it's been fascinating me now for almost three decades for a variety of reasons. And, and I could spend probably an hour telling you the reasons why I like regeneration, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let organisms show you what, I, what, what we think about regeneration. So here's a close relative. This is an echinoderm. It's a sea star. And uh, these animals actually can do something remarkable. I collected this animal uh, in the Vineyard Sound uh, off the coast of, um, of, uh, of uh, Woods Hole in, in Massachusetts. And it came in a uh, abandoned or, or already eaten um, uh, quay hawk shell. These are very large clams. And on one half was this part of the animal, which is missing an arm, as you can see uh, right there. Okay. And then on the other half of the clam was this, the other part of the arm growing an entire animal. That would be the equivalent of me cutting my little finger and watching me regenerate right before my eyes from my little finger. That's weird, but that's what nature does. There's no modifications here. It's what nature does. So this type of regeneration is common. It's, uh, and we refer to it as bidirectional regeneration, where both body parts will actually regenerate complete animals, right? But there are different flavors to regeneration. The next one is uh, one that is uh, familiar to, to, to some of you, perhaps. But I'm going to also use a very close relative to us. This is the uh, hemicorded worm, Tycholera flava. Uh, there's hemichordates, there's urochordates, hemichordates, and chordates. So uh, let's say that it's just one step below the chordates. Now, this is the adult worm. It's also known as an acorn worm. And uh, we were told in our textbooks that, that certain types of regeneration are just not possible in the deuterostome lineage, the lineage that produces us vertebrates, right? Uh, of course, nature doesn't listen to the memos that we write, and it will do what it wants to do. And so if you decapitate these animals as an adult, what you'll see is that it will actually regenerate a complete head in approximately 20 days. Now, this is remarkable because the genes that are being activated during embryogenesis to produce the head of this animal are essentially indistinguishable, spatially and temporally, from the same sets of genes that produce our heads when we were in our respective uh, mom's wombs. So the fact that these animals can actually reactivate these embryonic genes to produce a new head is remarkable, and it happens naturally. There's an even more remarkable, and some of you probably have seen it around here, because ungulates uh, really populate the, the hills here and probably campus, which is the restoration of antlers in deer and moose. This is, I think, one of the most fascinating um, uh, manifestations of regeneration in the animal kingdom. It's a mammal. It's not a weird worm or some crazy uh, stuff. It's a mammal. And the male of the species, every season, will actually shed their antlers, grow them again, through a remarkable process of growth and uh, formation and the development and cell death that still defies explanation. In fact, if you follow the same antlers from, that are shed from the same animal season after season, what you'll see is that the new antler remembers what the previous antlers looks like. So it's like a time lapse if you put it side by side. And there's a beautiful exhibition in the uh, Natural History Museum in London showing exactly that. And so the fact that these antlers are being shed but they are actually epithelialized, they're vascularized, they're ossified, and they grow rapidly because this is really what will determine who is going to be at the picking order of the next generation of, of that uh, group of animals is really a reflection of strict regulatory process that is genetic, perhaps environmental, as well as um, a, a cellular, right? 
And because the antlers do not regenerate a uh, deer, which would be pretty weird, we refer to this as physiological regeneration. No injury was introduced into the animal. They just shed their antlers, right? So these three types of regeneration essentially encompass most of the manifestations of regeneration we see in the animal kingdom. And I use these examples because they're close relatives to us. And when people think about regeneration, they think about strange organisms. And therefore, you know, it's happening in some, you know, sulfurous confines of evolution. It doesn't apply to us. And so why should we care about this? Now, the reality is that if you look at every phyla that's been described for metazoans, everything that's painted in green on that screen has organisms that do one or the other or perhaps all of these types of regeneration. It's extensive. And for those where there's no green on them, they're just black, we just don't know. We just have not studied those animals in sufficient detail to really say that they do or do not do this, this process. Now, we have actually chosen to identify an animal that could actually manifest all three types of regeneration. It's an organism that is actually a, in a sister group to the deuterostomes, to us. It's, they're known as the lophotrogozoans, which is a mouthful, or spiralians. But these animals, remarkably enough, have not been domesticated enough in modern life sciences for us to understand this large, you know, a clade of animals. They encompass the largest numbers of body plants in the planet, have the li largest number of species on the planet, and we almost know nothing about what the biology that these animals uh, execute um, uh, is like. And if you notice, on this tree right here, we share common ancestry. Okay, so the fact that we have ignored spiralians for as long as we have is almost as if you were trying to um, uh, build your lineage, your own personal lineage, while ignoring your entire maternal lineage. Good luck with that. I mean, you'll come to conclusions, sure. Some of them will be correct, some of them will be grossly incorrect, right? So I think it's appropriate for us to expand you know, our interrogation of nature by looking at organisms that exaggerate certain attributes. And here's the flat one. The tube that came out is actually its pharynx. It's actually eating a liquid diet we prepare for it. And then as they uh, ingest the food, that actually goes into a cavity that is their digestive system. And that food then is spread throughout the animal for it to grow and so forth. Now, we selected this animal because it shares some attributes with us. They are bilaterally symmetric. Uh, they have derivatives of all three germ layers. That means ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. So they have neurons, they have gut, they have skin, they have muscle, etc. And they also possess a collection of very complex organ systems. They do have a brain. They have photoreceptors and, and, and sensory organs. Uh, they have excretory systems and so forth. So we imagine that if we can extract some regeneration capacity or information from these animals, we should be able to inform the regenerative capacities or incapacities, so to speak, of other species that may be uh, related by ancestry. Okay, so this is not a new system. It's been around for a long time. In fact, T.H. Morgan, the same uh, gentleman that gave us uh, modern genetics, used to be an avid fan of these animals. And uh, he published beautiful papers in 1898 and 18, uh, uh, in 1901 describing the regenerative capacity of these animals. And this is how I got hooked, looking at these papers. So these animals can be sliced and diced in a number of ways. And every slice that you, that you produce normally produces a complete animal, right? So he wanted to know how is it that a slice of a, a chunk of planarian knows what part is going to regenerate a head and what part is going to regenerate a tail. And he imagined uh, in uh, 1898 that maybe the reason for that is that there was enough buffering capacity between both planes of amputation to allow for these planes of amputation to differentiate themselves. So then he surmised the following experiment. What if I actually cut the animal so thinly that now both of these amputation planes are so close to each other, they will not differentiate from each other? And what would happen? So he did that experiment, and this is what he got. He got animals that now had heads at both ends. OK, so he's going, OK, this is great, 1898. And um, I think editors back then were a little bit more forgiving than today, because the conclusion to his paper was, there is something here that's important to find an explanation for, <laughs> and he just moved on. <laughs> All right, I don't think we can get away with that today, but that's, that's, that's how it was. So you know, we really are fascinated by this capacity to store positional information, cellular identity, scale and proportion, uh, functional reintegration of newly formed parts to pre-existing parts. All of this is encompassing regeneration. And it's not an embryonic process. This is happening in adult animals, which is, again, another biological context we really don't understand much, including for our species. And, and the talks uh, uh, early in the morning actually uh, are a really good example of that. Now, 
few years ago, um, Kyle Gurley, when he was a postdoctoral scientist in my lab, uh, and, and, and others and myself decided that we're going to take all of these signaling pathways, some of which Mike actually uh, uh, mentioned earlier, to see what role these embryonic signaling pathways may actually play in adult regeneration. And the, one of the most famous pathways is the wind beta catenin pathway, and it's essentially these combinations of molecules that interact with each other to produce consequences that are usually reflected by gene activity, the synthesis of proteins, and the proteins affecting their, their, their functions to generate a, a specific biological uh, um, um, phenomenon. So in this particular case, uh, what we decided to do was to target by RNAi activators and inhibitors of this pathway. So we uh, do the following experiment. We will introduce the RNA into these animals, amputate the animals into heads, trunks, and tails, and then ask what happens in the context of the loss of one of these functions to the ability of these animals to regenerate. So when we targeted beta catenin, which is a transcription factor that binds to DNA and other proteins and activates gene function, we're essentially able to recapitulate Morgan's experiment. So we no longer need to, need to cut them very close. We just need to silence one gene. Out of the 20,000 genes that are codified by this genome, one gene was enough to change the identity of these planes of amputation, suggesting that these processes may be under really strict a genetic regulation. So now you can do the converse experiment, which is, okay, that's an, that's an activator. What if we now, uh, since we eliminated the activator, what if we now inhibit the repressor of beta catenin? Uh, what would happen if we now accumulate beta catenin in the cells of these animals? So we repeat the experiment. So we decapitate it, we look at the trunk, and now what we get, instead of uh, two heads, we actually get two tails at both ends. So a molecular switch, essentially, that determines whether or not you're going to make a head or you're going to make a tail. I was shocked, surprised. I didn't think it was going to be that straightforward. We still don't understand how this happens, frankly. But the reality is that now we have a toehold in trying to understand how this um, uh, polarity might be regulated in an adult. Now, if that's not enough, <laughs> and I thought it would be enough, I asked the following question to Kyle. I said, Kyle, you know, we are introducing a stimulus to these animals, which is a razor blade, okay, which they normally don't see in nature, right? So we're cutting them. Could it be that the act of cutting these animals is what's actually activating these pathways? And say, so, yeah, of course it has to be. Well, why don't we just eliminate beta catenin, but not cut the animal? Then what would happen then? So we do that experiment. We target beta catenin, and then we don't cut the animals, and this is what we get. <laughs> now we get animals that are growing heads everywhere there is a dorsoventral confrontation in the body plan of the animal. And the reason why they look cyclopic is because I did this experiment and I was too impatient, so I didn't silence the gene enough to actually get a full penetrant phenotype, right? So what this tells me, I think, at the time I found to be very profound, which is that this you know, stable outward appearance that we present to the world is belied by constant change. These pathways are on all the time. These pathways are also associated with tumors. These pathways are also associated with all kinds of maladies. And yet, they have to be on all the time to keep the functional and anatomical integrity of these animals. So how do you regulate that? It's a big mystery. But I think it's one that I, I think will eventually succumb uh, to, uh, to investigation. And so let me give you one uh, idea of how we think about this problem, because it, it is a really fascinating problem to me. So you realize that when you cut these animals, you're going to have a trunk that's going to be much larger than the size of the head that regenerates and the size of the tail that regenerates. So how do they scale? You can imagine scaling properties applying during embryogenesis. It's a really nicely choreographed as uh, processes of cell migration, cell proliferation, cell differentiation, and you get you know, the proportions that we're all familiar with when we look at ourselves in the mirror. So many years ago, I was reading my son, I was reading to my son uh, um, the, the Travels of Gulliver by Jonathan Swift, and I thought, well, this is a pretty cool book. And then I stopped dead on my tracks when I read this paragraph. And the paragraph is about the emperor of Lilliput trying to decide how we're going to feed this giant so he doesn't eat us. OK, so we, we need to feed him. Otherwise, they're going to eat entire Lilliput. And so the emperor um, asked his, uh, his, uh, his uh, subjects to do the following thing. They stipulated that a quantity of meat and drink sufficient for the support of 1,728 Lilliputians. I, I, I thought that's a really weird number, OK? But sometime after asking a friend at court how they came to fix on that determinate number, he told me that his majesty's mathematicians, having taken the height of my body, 
by the help of a quadrant and finding it to exceed theirs in the proportion of 12 to 1. This is the British unit of measure, okay? 12 to 1. Um, that mine, uh, 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 you see, must contain at least 1,728 of theirs. So this is just some math before lunch, okay? No, we're gonna eat lunch, okay? Let's do a little math before lunch. So here's what Swift did. He not only wrote this, he actually sat down and calculated. So he assumed a ratio of one to one for food intake and biomass. That's the assumption. Then he assumes that if the length of 12 Lilliputians is one Gulliver, all you have to do is take 12 to the cube, Euclidean geometry, and produce 1,728. That's what Gulliver needs to eat, okay? And so Euclidean geometry is what he was using, and that is something we humans invented, okay? And uh, that's uh, length uh, scales with mass, mass to the cube as a function of m to a uh, fraction of the dimension, in this case three dimensions, so it's to the one-third, and therefore if you now do the same thing, take 1728 and, and do an exponential to the third, you get 12. That's Euclidean geometry. The, the problem with that is that nature does not really follow Euclidean geometry. Uh, in fact, uh, food intake and biomass do not follow this exponential uh, component. We've known this for many, many uh, decades, if not centuries. Uh, in 1891 and later in 1932, Schnell and Kleiber demonstrated that metabolic rate, for example, and body mass are best fit by this so-called allometric equation, which describes the process but doesn't have any predictive power. Okay? And so if you were to calculate this, uh, uh, and, and, and you realize, after all of these measurements from all of these mathematicians and biologists, that the exponential is never one-third. It's actually three-quarters, or 0.75, okay? And so that will be the power scaling for biological systems. It goes from bacteria all the way to, like, you know, uh, sequoias on the western uh, uh, United States. What should have happened to Gulliver? He must have gained a lot of weight, okay? <laughs> Because what he should have really eaten, when you put, plug in all those numbers into the allometric equation, is 260 aerations, not 1,728. So he must have eaten every little lamb and every little cow they had, and, and they gained a huge amount of weight. And so planarians do something really, really cool, uh, which is that they do grow when you feed them. And they, here you see a picture from an animal that's about 0.5 millimeters in length, growing all the way up to about 4 millimeters in length. They get longer than that. If you starve them, they don't get skinny. If you starve them, they actually shrink back to 0.5 millimeters in size. They degrow. So how do, you shrink, how do you shrink a central nervous system? And the animals don't look abnormal. I mean, this is classic, you know, rotation student thing. I give them fed and unfed. Tell me the difference between them. I don't tell them what I did to them. And they cannot tell the difference. They put them through maces, do all kinds of things, and they cannot tell the difference. So they're functionally shrinking themselves, right? How do you do that? So um, we don't know how um, or why mass scales uh, doesn't scale to the third power, as one would expect uh, for 3D powers. But there is an entire curse industry of people out there that go out and measure things. So they measure the diameters of tree trunks and aortas. They are scaled to the body mass, 3 to the 8. That's, that's 0.75. Cellular metabolism and heart rate, one, 1 and a quarter. Uh, times of blood circulation, embryonic growth on lifespan scale, M and a quarter. Uh, all multiples of a quarter, right? And so it's really a, a, a phenomenal thing. Um, now, planarians, the name says that they're flat, so maybe they're not three-dimensional, which they are, but maybe they're not. Perhaps they don't obey the allometric equation. So we set out to measure this. And the way we did this, this was with a graduate student at the time, uh, Nestor Oviedo, was to actually uh, mark uh, the, or, or, or label the presence of these neurons that are in the anterior margin of the animal, and then count how many of these are added for every millimeter of growth and then how many are subtracted for every millimeter of, um, of degrowth. And we measure that, and then we say we now have data, we can weigh these animals, and with these numbers, we should be able to predict, even before we measure uh, their presence or absence, how many of these neurons may be present in the anterior margin. So we plugged in all these numbers uh, into the allometric equation, and here's what we got. So we predicted that for an animal of two millimeters in size, they would have anywhere, anywhere between 24 to 25 of these neurons per side of the animal. And then we would do the uh, labeling of the animal, and then we would see that, in fact, that was very close. And that was true between two to, six, uh, th two to eight millimeters. Now, the beautiful thing about Paneer is that you can cut them in funny ways. And so there are, there's an experiment where you decapitate an animal, and then you cut a little incision in the middle of the, uh, of the decapitated animal and separate the two trunks. They'll heal, and now instead of growing one head, they'll grow two heads. But they are half the size of the original head. 
So you would predict that they would have half the numbers of these neurons in the anterior margins. But when we do that experiment, what we find is that both half heads have the right numbers for a body plan of that left, suggesting that they're counting. I don't know how they're doing it, but they're counting. Again, this is really understandable. I mean, this is really vulnerable to experimentation. And so it is exciting for us to know that these particular processes are really addressable. Now, in the wild, planarians do not use razor blades to reproduce. These particular strains are asexual, and what they do is that they undergo fission. And we, it's like natural regeneration. And I just realized I misspelled that, so uh, apologies. That's not how you spell regeneration. Please don't take notes. Anyway, so it's the same animal. You see two cameras, one on the side of the animal, one from the top of the animal. And now we're going to watch this animal uh, reproduce itself. So the head begins to crawl towards 3 o'clock. The tail is anchored to the substratum. And now after uh, 20 minutes or so, they'll actually just snap. It's almost like pulling a rubber band, and it just snaps at a weak point. And you end up with an animal that looks like this. No tail, and a tail that has no body, practically. And both of those fragments will go on to regenerate a complete animal. Because these processes require understanding their anterior, posterior, and body axis, and so forth, and we had already known that some of these molecules are associated in these processes, we thought, are the molecules associated in, in polarity also involved in, in, uh, in asexual reproduction? So we set up a number of experiments where we would actually grow these animals very large. We would silence the specific genes with RNAi to uh, abrogate their function, and then ask, does it affect uh, uh, um, um, Fission. And uh, so the way we measure this is by putting them in these uh, wells with the camera on top. And every time that the animal would try a fission and fail, we'll make a tick down in time. And if it was successful fission, it'll be a tick going upwards. And that's what we see here. So control is at the very top. And now here you have a gene that's involved in the TGF beta pathway, an active receptor that completely abrogated the fission behavior. And then you see another regulator, the one that I show you that uh, grows uh, heads everywhere. Uh, uh, silencing APC, uh, what you see essentially is that it actually increased the number of events that were both successful and not successful fission, suggesting that these pathways are playing a role in the behavior. But we couldn't understand how, molecularly and cellularly, how this was going on. Um, and so we had to conclude that paper by saying that perhaps what's happening is that at the animals, as the animals get larger, these mechanosensory neurons that are at the end of the animal begin to separate and distribute themselves in a slightly different topological uh, distribution in the head of the animal, and that somehow de-repress the ability of this animal to not regenerate or not undergo fission. So by lifting that break, the animals could fission. And, you know, not a very satisfying explanation. Uh, but uh, these animals, because we were inhibiting fission, got really big. They got really, really big. And we had difficulties mounting these animals on cover slips, just to take a look at them. And so this is Chris Arnold uh, trying to mount these animals, and he discovers something really exciting and at the same time really embarrassing. So here are his fingers. He puts a cover slip on top of the animal, and by exerting just a little bit of pressure, all of a sudden these compression planes are revealed. You can see those fragments pop up, just like that. It is strictly reproducible. I say it's exciting because we were not expecting this, and I say it's embarrassing because it should have been discovered 200 years ago. Cover slips have been around for that long, and so have been on manicure fingers, okay? So it should have been discovered a long time ago. And so why hasn't it been discovered? How is it that, you know, um, that it took this long to, to, to find this out? Because in textbooks, you will be told that planarians are unsegmented. They have no segments. That's why they're old, blah, blah, blah. Well, apparently, they do have some sort of segments that are revealed by these compression planes. So we thought that perhaps the reason why we're seeing this Fission phenotypes is that, ah, the pathways modify the deposition of these compression planes, and that's how we can explain the phenotype we're seeing. It didn't. So all these phenotypes that I showed you earlier did not affect the compression planes at all. So then it got really more puzzling. And so Chris and I were going uh, to the cafeteria to get some coffee and discuss these results, and then I realized something that I should have realized earlier, and Chris realized it almost pretty much at the same time, is that perhaps we're thinking about this problem the wrong way. And so and the wrong way, essentially, is to assume that the animals were not segmented. So if they're, in fact, segmented, or there's some sort of segmentation, they should be deposited in a specific order. That's what you would expect, as you see in every other animal, right? Now, these are adults, OK? 
And so we went back to the lab, and then decided we're going to do this. We're going to take animals and feed them, grow them, and as they get longer, we'll do the compression planes. And what we found, essentially, is that these compression planes appear in a very stereotypical uh, uh, situation. So the first compression plane appears posteriorly, right, almost at the middle. We call that zero. The second one is anteriorly, plus one. And then as the animals get larger and larger, more and more appear anteriorly and posteriorly. And the correlation coefficient is on the right, and you can see yeah, on your right. So you can see essentially that it's really strict correlation. Then we can ask the question, do these compression planes appear in the same way in a fragment that's undergoing regeneration? So we take the animal, we cut a, a trunk as I showed you earlier, and then we do the same experiment, and lo and behold, they do it the same way. So this is baked in somehow, and, uh, and it's not clear how or why. More coffee later. Chris and I decided that perhaps really what we need to think about is that maybe this is a segmentation problem. And segmentation problems essentially have been resolved in embryogenesis and during development, early developmental biology by invoking the, uh, you know, the trophy genes of, 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 of metazoan genomes, which are the Hox genes, right? So these Hox genes in flies and in humans, these are really unified developmental biology are somehow activated in a very stereotypic way from anterior to posterior, and they define all these segments on the body plants of animals. But again, this happens during embryogenesis. We're talking about adult animals here. And so Chris said, well, you know, I don't think it's gonna work. But, I, I, but you know, I reminded him that when we first assemble the first draft of the genome, Brett Pearson, a postdoc in the lab, realized that the planarian genome, uh, even though it's an asexual animal, had all 13 Hox clusters, or Hox genes, sorry. And we, we've been trying, and many people have been trying to figure out what these hoxins do in planarians, and we assume that this may be remnants from when the animals were reproducing sexually, and that maybe in embryogenesis they were being activated. But we've never really looked at these compression planes before, so Chris set out to clone all of these hox genes, then do RNAi like we did for beta catenin, and now what we do is essentially the same experiment. And what we found essentially is that the elimination of the functions of these genes did have a consequence on the deposition and formation of these compression planes. Um, that is absolutely phenomenal in my mind because it suggests that all these so-called embryonic genes probably have functions beyond embryogenesis. And perhaps we're not really measuring them because we don't expect to see them there. But the fact that this is actually reproducibly uh, uh, obtained in these animals to the, to the tune of losing all the compression planes or even increasing the number of segments or compression planes that can be uh, introduced into these animals are very suggestive of something really, really interesting uh, going on here. Now, post 2B doesn't stop growing, okay? We have, we have animals that are essentially like little earthworms. You no longer need a, a, a magnifying glass to see them. And what's beginning to happen to these animals is that they're beginning to lose their allometric relationships. So I think this is, again, an opportunity for us to try to molecularly dissect the mechanisms by which allometries are specified. Why is the pharynx the length? that it is to the length of the animal. Why are the photoreceptors located at a distance, et cetera, et cetera. All this stuff is beginning to fall apart. So I think this is actually a, a really new opportunity for us to solve a longstanding problem of biology, which is regulation of allometry by using regeneration as a conduit. Okay, so at the root of all this lies a population of really remarkable cells, which were discovered by Harry Randolph in 1892 when she was doing her master's uh, um, degree at Bryn Mawr College in Pennsylvania. And these cells are called neoplasts, and they are now here depicted as these little silver uh, cells undergoing asymmetric cell division, and in pink in the middle is, the, uh, is a muscle fiber. I'm gonna shake them like a maraca. You can see the mitochondria come out. We are now gonna remove uh, the uh, crystalline um, 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 uh, cell membrane so we can actually see the chromosomes undergoing telophase, okay? And so the question for us is, how do these physical interactions between all of these cells uh, actually maintain the form and function of the animal and, again, rebuild it whenever that homeostatic state is lost by amputation or asexual reproduction? So the way we did this is to first try to characterize these cells and make sure that the cells were really pluripotent so we can now uh, uh, purify them. And this is what these cells looked like. Uh, this was the first time that I saw a live pluripotent adult stem cell. Uh, in, in for the first time, you can see I have these weird processes, and the experiment is very simple. We are going to inject a cell into an animal that has uh, been subjected to irradiation where all the stem cells have been eliminated and ask, can this one cell rescue the viability of these animals? So that's the experiment. 
We take animals that have no stem cells. We inject a single cell. You see the, uh, the white spot in the middle there. And then we ask, will the animal die or will the animal survive? And to our surprise, about 25% of all these injections resulted in viability, suggesting that this one cell has all the information that it may need to actually launch a restoration response. It does need its environment, but that cell alone can actually bring everything back to, uh, to its proper uh, situation. So this is very exciting. Now, I was going to talk about stochasticity because this is really how we think about uh, the regulation of these neoblasts. They're very, very abundant. The, the deterministic model for stem cell biology in planarians does not apply readily. One has to think about these cells as being unsynchronized, stochastically entering and exiting transitional, uh, um, uh, transcriptional states, and is essentially whenever the knife falls in, or whenever a sexual person comes in, whatever cells were in a particular state, those are the ones that are going to respond uh, to, to the changes in the environment. And so that's one idea that we're pursuing, so we wanted to measure this. And so Mike mentioned a little bit about single cell sequencing. So we essentially wanted to follow the transcriptional states of both the neoblast, the stem cells, and the differentiated cells across time. So we collected the smallest fragment that a planarian can regenerate a full planarian from, dissociated it into individual cells at seven different time points under three different conditions, and then generated an atlas, a single cell atlas that essentially describes the transcriptional profiles of these cells. And this is what this atlas looks like. And it encompasses essentially all of the cell types that are known to exist in planarians. And uh, that's represented by the colors that I'm going to show you in just a second. Uh, green represents muscle. In the center, the lilac uh, structure right here, uh, that is actually where all of the stem cells reside. And, uh, and essentially everything was represented. But since we collected time points, what we want to know is, did we collect a good representation of all the cells at all the various time points? So we can decorate this, uh, this um, um, this uh, 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 cell atlas, not by their identity, but by when the cells were collected. So I'm going to show you what muscle looks like. All of these cells are supposed to be muscle. Also notice one thing, which is really interesting. All of these clusters that are formed in these uh, statistics that we call UMAP statistics, essentially are trying to identify cells that are very similar to each other. <laughs> but they should all really land in a very small space. And yet they're distributed in clouds. So they're not really identical to each other. So there's a degree of stochasticity in their expression profiles that results in this type of representation. So now we ask, which of these muscle cells, they're all muscle cells by identity, which ones are responding to injury? And what we find is that it's not all of them. It's only a small group of muscle cells are responding to injury and turning on an essential gene for regeneration, in this case, NOTUM, which modulates that wind beta catenin pathway that I mentioned to you earlier. And if you can see on the, on the right side, this green collection of cells right here uh, is actually present in a group of cells right here at the beginning that are present for just a period of time, a short period of time. They express the gene and they stop expressing it. And so when we actually follow all the germ layers and identify genes like this, we find these really interesting expression profiles. Subsets of cells within that population expressing for a short period of time a very small subset of genes. And when you target these genes for function, you find that the genes that are expressed really early on, they're all required for polarity. The genes that are expressed early on and sustain and decay until they're undetectable by day 14, they're all involved in regulating the proliferation of the stem cells. And the genes that come on and then die, they're all involved in the maintenance of the stem cells and the tissue remodeling that's required to restore the viability of, of these animals. So I, I think this is a, a, a really remarkable finding for one reason and one reason only. It's just the technological armamentarium that's available to us today. It's unlike anything in the history of science, at least in biology. Um, if we had done this experiment by measuring only like 5,000 cells or 6,000 cells, we would have missed these states. We would not detect them. The cells that were actually carrying out this very fundamental function is a fraction of a percent of the 300,000 cells that we actually canvassed. So we could have missed it easily and gone into thinking that we knew we understood this problem quite well. And so where do these cells, we're referring to tracks, these stochastic states reside? We, we don't know yet. So we now take advantage of another tool, which is called spatial transcriptomics, which allows you to measure the activities of genes in situ, right inside of the animal. That allows us to identify relationships between cells. And so you essentially take the animals, you cut them, and you take those fractions, you mount them in a, in a matrix, and then you section them. 
And then in the sections, you can stain it for histological purposes. You can label the nuclei so you can count all the cells. And then you lay these uh, sections on top of beads that have a bunch of um, uh, oligonucleotides that will bind to the endogenous RNA from which you can make cDNA libraries to know what genes are being expressed. And when we do that, what we find essentially is that we are now beginning to identify domains to which these stem cells are associated with during regeneration in the actual, uh, with the actual uh, differentiated cells. And so that's what this data looks like. Uh, it will generate, again, another UMAP. At this time, you're not looking at cells. You're looking at, at uh, beads uh, with particular expression profiles. And I just want to mention briefly these two um, uh, clusters, 26 and 17. They are a mixture of neoblast transcription or stem cell transcription and gut transcription and stem cell transcription and parenchymal cell transcription. And when we now go and take these genes and go to the animal and see wh what cells are expressing what, what we find essentially is that there is a relationship between these parenchymal cells, which are depicted here in purple, and white are the nuclei, with the neoblast, the stem cells, which are depicted in green. And so early on, by six hours, they're loosely associated, but by 48 hours, these parenchymal cells are completely decorated by these neoblasts. These are transient, temporary interactions that eventually result in the restoration of, um, of form and function. So I'm going to conclude what I just shared with you today uh, with the following thoughts, um, because I think these are really uh, tremendous times in, in biology. Uh, irrespective of whether or not the world is burning or not, biology right now is really on fire for the right reasons, right? And so I actually would like to posit the following. I like to posit that adult cells actually possess remarkable plasticity. And that plasticity is manifested in stochastic ways. I, I would like to propose that. We have an idea that our tissues are determined. We, in fact, we use that term in developmental biology, determine, and then differentiate. And once they're determined, that's it. It's game over for that cell. But I would like to say that perhaps cells are not that way. The second thing I would like to posit is that we have plenty of data now, tangentially evidentiary material, that makes, should, makes us wonder that this plasticity is really broadly spread across multiple organisms because every single UMAP that you've seen or TSNI plot you've seen will give you clusters of cells that are not like principal component analysis graphs where it's just one dot in that three-dimensional space. It's usually a cloud. You could argue that it's perhaps on the representation or stochasticity on what gene was amplifying that cell, but the depth of sequencing has increased significantly and the sizes of the clouds are not getting any smaller, suggesting that even though you may be a muscle cell, your transcriptional profile is not going to be 100% identical to the muscle cell that's next to you. It might be different, but you're still a muscle cell. And I refer to those things as transcriptional states. And that kind of plasticity, I think we need to begin to appreciate. So I would like to you know, um, uh, convince people that we should really stop calling cells, adult cells, terminally differentiated. We should really refer to them as stably differentiated. A terminally differentiated cell is dead. That's how I see it, all right? But a stably differentiated cell has the opportunity, perhaps, of responding to environmental changes that it could not do otherwise if it were terminally differentiated. How do we respond to injury? I mean, we heal, right? How do we respond to uh, infections? We heal. And so the fact that these terminally differentiated adult cells can actually change the transcriptional profiles to deal with the vicissitudes of the environment, which are stochastic and unpredictable, it's something that we really need to take into consideration when we think about cells in general. And so to sum it up, I think that for us working in regeneration, one of the major things that we need to accomplish is to reveal the mechanisms that promote and suppress such stable differentiation. Because that may be the reason why regeneration is so broadly but unevenly distributed across the animal kingdom. That perhaps in some species, adult cells that are supposed to be terminally differentiated are less capable of occupying multiple transcriptional states and respond in a way that may actually trigger a regenerative response. And this is an eminently testable uh, hypothesis that is truly vulnerable to experimentation. So I think if we can focus on trying to get that done, we might be able to gain some real understanding of why regeneration uh, play, uh, 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 occurs in some animals and not others. I need to conclude by thanking the people who do all this work because I've been very privileged to uh, attract a cohort of really, really brilliant uh, uh, investigators to my lab. And uh, the work that I show you of, uh, of the track cells was done by uh, Biff here and Blair. 
uh, the work that I show you on the uh, stretching of the worm, uh, it was done by Chris and also um, by Blair and Anne Zhang right here, did actually the purification of the neoblast. And with that, I'll stop, and if there is time, I'll take some questions. <laughs> That's cool. Well, what an absolutely fascinating talk. Thanks so much. So I'm sure there'll be questions, but let me just start again by taking moderator's uh, privilege and okay. ask you, if we think about, you, you left with uh, your conclusions about terminally differentiated cells, we should rename them and thinking about higher organisms and their potential for regeneration. Mm -hmm. There is another possibility which uh, has long interested me, maybe, uh, attempts at regeneration in the wrong place mm -hmm. could actually be uh, pathogenic. They could be yeah. disease mechanisms. And yeah. the one that, of course, I'm most interested in is in the brain. Mm -hmm. Classically, terminally differentiated neurons. There is a, uh, there is a hypothesis that uh, Alzheimer's disease might actually be an attempt at regeneration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The evidence for that is, uh, is a number of different things. But mm -hmm. chiming with your talk, Wnt signaling is undoubtedly involved in the Alzheimer's yep. disease process. Yep. And the last thought about this is that the phosphorylation of tau that is the target of many of our drugs in development and mm -hmm. clearly the executor of uh, pathogenesis, actually, it is a reversion to a fetal state. Mm -hmm. It isn't, com I mean, it's pathogenic only at Mm -hmm. only if you're above the age of 50. When yeah. you're in utero, it's exactly what you need your neurons to be. Yeah. No, that's a really good question, and uh, it's something that uh, many of us think about, that, uh, you know, uh, some people refer to certain types of uh, tumors as a heal that did not wound properly. Or did, 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 uh, sorry, a wound that did not heal properly, for example. Uh, I, I actually um, believe that when tissues uh, lose their homeostatic functions by, you know, either the formation of plaques or by um, the invasion of viruses or infections or what have you, the cells will respond. And it's very likely that, that response is going to invoke processes that may be very similar to the initial processes of wound healing or wound response that we see in regeneration. So that's actually a major topic of research, is trying to find out how different is the regeneration response to wound response or to infection response. And the bottom line is that there are a number of common denominators. Now, how they are deployed in time and space and in various tissues really depends widely. And that we don't understand. Um, for tissues that are not turning over on a regular basis, like for example, the neurons of our brain, fortunately, otherwise I don't think we'll remember anything. Although I don't need help not to remember anything already. But, um, but um, that actually is a, a really complicated problem. But you can imagine that what may, may be happening is that while you may have that neuron from the moment you were born to our present day, it's highly unlikely that the components of that neuron remain the same as they were 58, 59 years ago. So they're also reconstructing themselves on a regular basis. I mean, those receptors are going to be uh, cycled. Um, RNAs are going to be synthesized and destroyed. Um, maybe epigenetic marks are going to be modified. So, so the cells are not really static. They're, co they're constantly dynamic. They may not re-enter the cell cycle but they're constantly rebuilding themselves, right? And I think it's part of that process that somehow has been, um, if not co-opted, has been uh, derived from the ability of simpler systems to essentially restore themselves in, in, in that process. So planarians are funny in that way because uh, they essentially don't age. They're constantly rebuilding themselves. They're not immortal because I can kill them, my graduate students can kill them, but, but they're constantly rebuilding themselves. And I think those are the processes that are in need of understanding such that we can try to address the uh, issues that you just brought. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, so I think we've probably got time for two questions before lunch. Um, and we'll Alejandro, let one of the Larrys finish. Really enjoyed uh, your outline. Thank um, you. In complex multicellular organisms like migrating birds, mm -hmm. um, they can resorb their intestine on travel and then rebuild it once they land in the area where nutrients are available. Has work been done that compares the work that you've done here to look at the mechanism based on which that regeneration occurs? Of course, nice to know that because we have some problems ourselves that could be solved if we knew more. No, no, I, I agree. I, I, but see, but this is, this is the big 
tragedy as I see it. I mean, it's pretty clear to you, right, that this would be a really important thing to solve and to know. But it's not pretty clear to funding agencies that, that it is really an important thing for us to know, right? And we are in an age where a lot of this biology, which was deemed inaccessible just 10, 15, 20 years ago, is fully accessible. We don't need to collect you know, biochemical amounts of birds to do the studies that we need to do. I mean, like vats of them, right? We need small biopsies. Those small biopsies, you can, you can do single cell uh, sequencing, you can do a tax seek, you can do bulk RNA seq, you can do a methylome, you can do all kinds of things. And if you can actually collect that data, which requires almost no discipline to obtain, because it's now plug and play, I mean, no discipline to obtain, one should be able to begin to decorate and inform our understanding of how these processes take place in the real world. Right? In the real world, not, not in a petri dish, not in a domesticated environment like a lab, but in the real world. And I think that's a big, 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 big flow in the uh, life sciences today. What we don't understand, what we don't really want to appreciate, is that 100,000 years ago, when Homo sapiens began to roam you know, the Earth out of Africa, okay, the genes that that species inherited, they were selected at a time where there was no intelligence, okay, there was no uh, society, there was no culture, there was no attempt to change the environment around us. So we are living in, you know, in, uh, in a postmodernist world with prehistoric genes. And then we're hoping that by studying these domesticated systems, we understand how these genes function are going to apply to the causes of disease. When in fact, we don't even know what the original functions of many of those genes may have been before we had an opportunity for the things to manifest. So I agree with you a thousand percent. Uh, and that's really bad math, but a thousand percent nonetheless. <laughs> because I mean, if we just gain that much understanding, there's a lot of things that um, seem incomprehensible today that will probably fall into place and go, aha, uh -huh, this is why this is happening. This is why this is happening. So I would love to do stuff like that. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting any younger, let's put it that way. And, uh, and I would like to try to encourage other people to, to do this. It wouldn't take that much of an effort, to be frank. And I love that idea, by the way. Alejandro, that was wonderful. Thank okay, you. I usually say at the end of this conference, my brain is full. At the end of your talk, my brain is full. <laughs> uh, there were so many things, and I'm, I'm going to ask you just a question about one of them. And it, uh, one of the things that surprised me the most is when you put up the, the tree and, and showed us the bilateria, mm -hmm. um, how widespread regeneration was. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. I really thought it was just a few organisms. Yep. Yep. So what it raises for me are questions of what the evolutionary pressures are that drive either the, the ability to do that or drive out the ability. What is it that we lose when we, when, what is it that, or, that animals lose when they can regenerate? What, what is it that evolutionary forces are working on? Around yeah, no, th th that is a great question and it's embarrassing that in the second decade of the 21st century, I cannot give you a real explanation for this. And so um, it is not clear to us if regeneration occurred once in evolution and then it was adopted or orphaned by some different species as they evolved, or alternatively, that every species that manifests regeneration invented its own way to regenerate, or even more alternatively, that both of these things happen at the same time. And so, you know, you could posit ideas that maybe salamanders are great at, re at regenerating, but perhaps for us to gain intelligence, we had to lose the ability to regenerate. For example, I mean, it's a crazy idea, but you know, it's almost as good as any other explanation I've heard so far. Uh, we don't have a real mechanistic understanding of what's going on. In fact, there's been little effort, and we're trying to, to that's something we are really actively trying to do, is to do a systematic comparison of the regenerative events that take place in those animals that regenerate to see whether or not they're common denominators. And what we're finding out is the following, is that there are a few core things that are shared across millions of years of evolution, but there's a large number of events that are only important to that species because they, another species that's closely related doesn't even use them at all for regeneration. So we need to remove all that noise first. And I, I liken it to, uh, to the Hox genes because before the discovery of the Hox genes, developmental biology was in the same boat. You look at a clam embryo, you look at a mouse embryo, you look at a human embryo, how could these things be the same? And then there was this Hox moment some molecular understanding that unify the whole field. Regeneration hasn't had its hot moment yet. So for those students among you, that could be you, okay? 
because that would really revolutionize the way we think about you know, adult developmental biology, post-embryonic developmental biology, which occurs day in and day out. So that's the best explanation I can give you right now. So I, I have to just and follow up just a tiny bit. I'm sorry, Simon. Um, but so is there a relationship with tumor growth? You, you mentioned tumors in, in the previous answer. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious if the organisms that can do regeneration are different than ones that can't with respect to cancer. Yeah, no, they're notoriously different and somewhat refractory to uh, the acquisition of tumors. Uh, they have tumor suppressors uh, like P53, P10, and uh, RB, you know, the unholy trinity of, uh, of human cancers, okay? Um, and um, planarians have all three, okay? And uh, we have silence all of them. And what we find is that they're not really preventing tumor formation. They're doing slightly different things, which made us think about where does the term tumor suppression come from? It's a description of a phenotype. How would nature select for a disease causing gene? That sounds almost counterintuitive. And then the next question is, do we really know what these genes actually do to begin with? And so that led us down a rabbit hole, uh, which uh, is really interesting, uh, which is that while all of these animals that regenerate are undergoing hyperproliferation to launch a regenerative response, and yet they don't get tumors, when you look at the genes that are associated with tumor progression and tumor function, P53, which is one of the most heavily studied genes in, in, in the history of, of, of the life sciences, there are three copies of those in the human genome. And people argue that two of those copies duplicated in us humans because Drosophila only have one. Nematodes only have one. But a single cell organism, coanoflagellate, already has two copies. Now, what is a single cell animal doing with two tumor suppressors? What is it gonna suppress, right? And so, I, I don't know. So I think that we really need to think about this problem slightly differently. Whether or not we have 500,000 papers on P53, Maybe the question to ask is, what is the evolution of tumor suppression, as opposed to what is the evolution of the gene that we think is a tumor suppressor? And that work is not being done as, as, as vigorously as I would like it to see uh, done. But that, that's the situation. I think that's the reason why I cannot give you a really solid answer, because the genes that we usually call to action to explain uh, tumor genesis are being used for, by, uh, by these animals in very interesting ways, but they're not causing tumors when they are deleted. Wow. So this has just been great. I don't know about our brains being full, but my brain has been regenerated in a stochastic, <laughs> yet also targeted and precise way. So I want you to thank all four speakers. It's been a great morning. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Lunch is going to be served upstairs in the tent. So if you want to go outside and up the stairs, um, it's all.